All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Hi, I'm Dr. Michelle Sands, and today we're going to be talking about hair loss, female hair loss, and how it occurs around menopause. We're going to talk about why it happens, what's causing it, what's at the root, and there's many things, so not just one. And then we're going to talk about some stuff that you can do naturally and also maybe not so naturally to reverse the hair loss and grow your hair again, because it is possible. The reason for this topic, hair loss for women is super emotional. So more men lose hair than women. It's much more common for men to lose hair than it is for women to lose hair, but men can lose hair and be completely bald and they can be voted the sexiest man alive. Women, on the other hand, it's not like socially acceptable for us to go bald. And so it's very emotional. It's very traumatic and it's very common. So the statistics are for women up to age 50, like premenopausal women, about one third of women will experience significant hair loss. And then after menopause, postmenopausal, two thirds of women will suffer from extreme hair loss, hair thinning, or even bald spots. And so it's a huge issue and it's so emotional. It's something that I dealt with actually when I dealt with thyroid issues and my premature ovarian failure diagnosis in my twenties, I had patches of hair actually coming out. And so now my hair is pretty full and I don't really have any bald spots. I'll talk about what I did as well in this video. Let's talk about what is actually going on. So it's actually the medical term for hair loss is alopecia. There's different types of alopecia. And for men, it generally happens, male pattern balding or male pattern hair loss is generally goes receding at the hairline and kind of does like a little M shape where it starts coming back here. For women, it's a little different. We generally start to lose hair around our part. So the part starts to get wider and then it can also start thinning through the sides and it can start thinning all over. We might notice that more hairs are falling out in the shower. There's more hairs in our comb. Now it is completely normal to lose about 50 to 100 hairs a day because our hairs are not always in the growing phase. We actually have three phases of hair growth and at all times your hairs on your head are in one of these three stages. So there is the, what's called the anagen stage, and that is the growth stage. So that's when your hair is actually actively growing. And then there's the catagen stage. That is where it is. Think about anabolic. So anabolic, like anabolic steroids, that's building. So that's when your hair is growing. Catagen is like catabolic, where it's breaking down. So that's where your hair is actually falling out. And then there's the telogen phase, and that phase is the resting phase. So the problem occurs when your hair is spending too much time in the falling out stage or the resting stage and not enough time in the growing stage. And that can happen for a variety of reasons. One of them is hormones related to menopause, which we'll talk about what the science is behind that. But other reasons also are going to be nutrition deficiencies. So things like iron deficiency anemia that can definitely cause hair loss. Low protein consumption can definitely cause hair loss. Also some minerals like not having enough selenium or boron or zinc, those can also lead to hair loss. So it's not always hormonal. And then there's also thyroid issues. If you have low thyroid or hypothyroidism, you might notice hair loss as well. And then also stressful events, even pregnancy. A lot of women notice when they are with child, when they are pregnant, hair is thick and full and shiny and beautiful because you're flooded with estrogen and progesterone. And then postpartum, the hormones flush out of your system and women notice they, they lose quite a bit of hair. So that's another reason, but the stress, if you have a big stressor in your life, that's actually called telogen effluvium. So it's a big fancy word for hair loss that happens due to stress. So it could be a childbirth. It could be an accident. It could be things like a divorce or a fire or a hurricane or anything like that. The good news is with telogen effluvium, this is something that is quite reversible. So once you remove the stressor, the hair can start to grow back. But it's really important to note that everything that your hair is doing is it's doing it in three months back. So if you have a stressor now, your hair might fall out three months from now. If you're doing something like improving your nutrition, restoring a deficiency, 
you won't notice that benefit for three to six months down the line. So that's where it can get confusing what the cause of the hair loss is. So if you are losing hair and you don't think it's related to menopause, I would suggest going to a dermatologist. They will actually evaluate your scalp, see if there's any fungus or any issues with the skin on your scalp, look at thyroid testing, look at nutrient deficiencies. But the bulk of women, especially in my audience, a lot of women who are watching are going to be above age 35. So that's going to be, you're going to be in the perimenopause stage. After age 30, our hormones start declining pretty steadily. And then when we hit 45 to 51, and we hit that menopause, they, they really take a nose that. But after age 35, you are starting to lose your hormones, your estrogen and progesterone that can put you into the situation where you're going to have what's called androgenic alopecia. So androgenic alopecia is just, all that is, is androgen related alopecia. So hair loss, and it's genetic because it's genetic. It's basically a genetically determined shortening of the phase of hair growth and a lengthening of time of the phase of hair falling out. And so that's not what we want. Like I said, at any given time, a third of our hair is in each of those phases. And when we have hormone decline with menopause, we might find that we have changes to the hair follicle itself. And so the hair follicle itself, which is responsible for growing the hair, actually responds to how we have our androgens in our body. So we're talking about testosterone, and DHEA, and they're no longer opposed by the estrogen, the progesterone. So now we have a situation where we have these androgens, which we've always had. So women have make testosterone, just like men make testosterone. Women just make a lot less of it. And when we hit menopause, our testosterone doesn't go up. Just the fact that our estrogen and progesterone start to decline makes our body more sensitive to that testosterone. And what can happen is that can actually shrink our follicles. So when we, our follicles shrink, it's actually called the follicular miniaturization. So it just means shrinking of the follicles, they get miniature. And as a result, the hairs get smaller, they get thinner, they turn into vellus hairs, and they actually, the follicle can actually completely shrink and just slough off like a skin cell. And then you don't make any more hair from that follicle. Why does this happen? As we go through menopause and perimenopause and our estrogen levels start decreasing, our liver makes less of a substance called sex hormone binding globulin. So it's a big word. All it means is that it binds up our hormones. So it's like a protective measure in our body. We make this enzyme by our liver that actually determines whether the hormones floating around in our body are actually free and available or if they're bound up and unusable. And when estrogen and progesterone are at normal reproductive levels, we have a, an amount of the sex hormone binding globulin that's going to preferably bind our testosterone. So there's a lot of it that's going to be bound and there's some of it that's still going to be free. When estrogen and progesterone decline, that sex hormone binding globulin drop, and now we become much more sensitive to this testosterone that hasn't gone up, but it's still the same level, but the much more of it is free. So now we have all this free testosterone and not enough estrogen or progesterone to combat it. And that is what can actually start to cause some of the issues that we see in menopause. We might see hair in places we don't want it, like on our chin, on our face. We might see our hair starts to fall out. We might start to gain weight around our midsection. So those are all things that are related to that androgen sensitivity. So it's not that testosterone is bad. We definitely need testosterone, but some of us have a genetic preference for the 5-alpha reductase, reductase pathway. So it's the 5-alpha reductase path, pathway. And what that actually does is it breaks testosterone down to what's called dihydrotestosterone. And that is also known as DHT. You may have heard of DHT. And when you have DHT is preferred when you have a lot of that and not enough estrogen and progesterone, then what happens is you have that shortening of the growing phase and the lengthening of the falling out phase. And that is where hormone replacement therapy can be a huge benefit 
for anyone in perimenopause or menopause to bring those estrogen and progesterone levels back up. Estrogen in and of itself helps with circulation to the scalp, helps to produce a thicker, fuller hair, helps with youthfulness. Progesterone also is helpful for hair growth and they oppose the testosterone, they increase the sex binding hormone. And so you can have a happy kind of balance in your life. And so that is super helpful. Now, there are some women in cases like PCOS that make too much testosterone. And in those cases, they may not be able to bring their estrogen and progesterone up high enough to balance it out. And so what you can do is there are some DHT blocking medications, things like spironolactone or finisteride or some birth control pills like the Yaz birth control pill have that 5-alpha reductase blocker. In our practice, we like to go, I'm a naturopathic physician, so we like to go the natural route and what we like to use is a blend of saw palmetto, pygium, and nettles. And this is helpful even sometimes on hormone replacement therapy to keep those excess androgens not going down the negative pathway. So because you don't want to get rid of all your testosterone, you still want it because we need it for so many things, our bone health, our mood, our sex drive. So we want testosterone. We just don't want it going down that alpha reductase pathway. And for some of us, it's actually genetically determined whether we're going to prefer that, but we might not notice that it's a problem until our estrogen and progesterone start to go downhill. That's one of the reasons why estrogen and progesterone replacement are super helpful with hair loss. Now, there's other things that come into play as well. And depending on how long you've had depleted estrogen and progesterone, or if there's other things happening in your life or in your body that's causing the hair loss together, you might need a little more than hormone replacement. And just know that once you start replacing your hormones, it takes three to six months before anything starts to happen. And even then it's the little tiny baby hairs that are going to start growing. So I don't know if you can see, I don't know if you can see on my head, these little hairs, that these are the new hairs. Those are the old hairs. So those are hairs that have grown after I had my son Paxton and I had some thyroid issues. So now my hair is pretty full, but I did go through some periods even after COVID. If any of you have gotten super sick, hair starts to fall out and it takes a while for it to get back. So once you start the intervention, you have to give it at least six months, maybe a year before you can really judge whether that intervention is working. And then also you might want to explore other possible causes of hair loss. Like I said, going to a dermatologist, they'll check your scalp for inflammation or fungal infections, checking for hypothyroidism. So looking at your complete thyroid panel, your TSH, your total and free T3, total and free T4, reverse T3 and thyroid antibodies. Also looking at like hairstyling techniques, don't pull your hair back in too tight of a ponytail, don't heat style too much. And then also looking, like I said, at nutrient deficiencies. So iron, zinc, selenium, and boron are big as well as protein deficiencies. So make sure that you're eating at least 0.7 to one gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight. So again, it's 0.7. So 0.7 to one gram of protein per day per pound of ideal body weight. So if you're in the UK, you know, you use kilograms or Canada, but if we're to make it easy, one pound is 2.2 kilograms, I believe, or one, yeah, or one kilogram. Oh, sorry. I might get that wrong. But, and when I say ideal body weight, so if you are overweight right now, so if let's say, you're five, five, and you weigh 250 pounds, that's overweight. So you don't want to eat based on the 250 pounds. You want to eat based on what an ideal body weight would be. So maybe 150 pounds. So 150 grams of protein between 120 and 150 grams of protein for someone who is like five foot five well, would be great. That's what, how you want to calculate that to make sure that you're getting the raw materials because your hair is made of like keratin and different proteins. So if you don't have raw materials to actually make your hair, your body will not make it. If your body has to decide between fueling your muscles or your heart or your brain or making hair, it's going to say, we don't really need hair. It doesn't really have any, serve any purpose. So your hair will fall out and your body will reserve that protein that you're not eating enough of 
for your hair. There's also other natural remedies that you can do. There's, if you go to a doctor's office, they might recommend something like stem cell therapy or PRP, which is platelet rich plasma. This is where they actually will draw your blood and spin it in a centrifuge and they'll pull out the platelet rich plasma and they'll either microneedle it or apply it to your scalp to help reawaken those follicles. Also red light therapy. So I actually love red light therapy for a variety of things, for skin health, for anti-aging, for recovery. But I actually have, I don't know if you can see, let me just, oh, I just lost my screen. Let's see. Oh, here we are. I don't know if you can see that, but this is like a little red light lamp that I have at my desk. Let's see. They can turn on and you just get red light therapy, you can put it on your head. And that's super convenient. I think it was like a couple hundred dollars, but it's really good. It also interchanges to blue light therapy. If you have any, anyone in your house who deals with acne, blue light is really great for acne. It's not like, like the negative blue light that we talked about, like in your household, but it's a particular spectrum of light that is super awesome. So there's that. And then there's other natural remedies that you can use as well. Things like rosemary essential oil is a good one. You can apply rosemary essential oil, rub it in. That actually helps with circulation to the scalp. It can also be very relaxing. So that is a really good one. Other things that you can do is, let's see, pumpkin seed oil, taking that orally, that can be helpful. Omega-3 fatty acids. And like I said, taking a really good multivitamin so that you get your zinc, you get your iron iron, you get your boron. We really really glow. That is actually my multivitamin that has in it, not only all your multi-nutrients, but you have your stress support in your adaptogenic herbs and your hormone support and your thyroid support. So it covers many areas of help for your hair. And then another thing that you can do, it's not technically natural, but there is over the counter, it's called minoxidil. It used to be brand name Rogaine. And it's a topical that you just put on your hair and it does regrow your hair. So whether it's because of hormones or whether it's because of another reason, the minoxidil works for most people, doesn't work for everyone, but it used to be a blood pressure medication. So it actually started as a blood pressure medication that was taken orally. And what they found is that people who used it started growing their hair back. So now it's a topical and it's actually over the counter and they sell it at CVS or any grocery store, you can get it on Amazon, you can get generic or name brand, but you just apply it to your scalp. You have to apply it. It can come in a liquid or a foam. You can put it in a spray bottle or it comes in a little dropper and you just put it on your hair and the areas that you are losing hair and you have to do it every day. They actually sell a 2.5%, which is approved for women. And then they sell a 5% that's approved for men. You, the women can use the 5% because the two and a half percent has to be used twice a day and the 5% can be used just once a day. So if it was me, if I was going to use it, I would get the 5%. And all you do is you apply it every day. So you can apply it, let it dry, then you can style your hair or you can apply it, let it dry and then go to bed and then you can wash your hair in the morning. And some people say it makes their hair feel a little greasy, but most people don't have any problem with it because it, it works for a lot of people. You won't know that it's working until you use it for six months. The downside of minoxidil, and it's M-I-N-O-X-I-D-I-L is minoxidil. I don't sell it. I'm not like a, in any way affiliated with it. And it's not hundred percent natural, but I feel like it's my duty to share with you every option that you have, because if I was losing a lot of my hair, I would probably use it. Even if it's not natural, because the quality of life and the trauma and the emotional heartache that would go along with going bald, I'd trade that off for using something that's not so natural. There really aren't many side effects, but definitely check with your physician before using anything and read the warnings on the box and all of that. But like I said, you have to wait, you have to use it every day and you have to use it for six months to know if it works. And the downside is you have to keep using it pretty much for the rest of your life. Otherwise it will stop, your hair will not start falling out again. It'll return to its natural state once you stop using it. So that's the downside. And for some people, it's worth it. So what I recommend is a combination of all of these things. Number one, treat the root cause. Is the root cause your thyroid? Is the root cause your nutrient deficiencies? Is the root cause stress? 
or is the root cause your declining hormones with menopause? The good news is if it's the declining hormones in menopause and you do hormone replacement therapy, if it's bioidentical topical hormone replacement therapy, not only are you going to help your hair, but you're also going to help your bones and your heart. You're going to help your brain preventing Alzheimer's. You're probably going to have other symptoms that come up like vaginal dryness, dry skin, hot flashes, night sweats, insomnia, the list goes on and on. So that will actually have multi-benefits. And if it helps your hair also, that's great. Same thing with nutrient deficiencies. If you are deficient in, let's say selenium, that's really hard on your thyroid. So if you replace that, and it helps your hair and it also helps your thyroid, then that's wonderful. Stress reduction, if you reduce, find, figure out what the stressor is and either find a way to avoid that stressor or employ some stress reduction technique, stress management, whether that's EFT tapping, hypnosis, rapid transformation therapy, meditation, journaling, deep breathing, whatever that is for you that's going to help you in so many ways as well. And if there is inflammation, if there is a skin issue, if there is a fungal issue, if there's something going on at the scalp level, finding that out is going to be important as well. I'll open it up for questions now and see, looks like there might be a couple of questions. Awesome. So I'm getting a lot of shedding even after having a trim. The hair just keeps coming like long pieces of hair. And even it feels different, like they're being stretched. How can I move out of the shedding phase into the growing phase? It depends on why you're staying in the shedding phase. So it like could definitely be hormonal. So it could be the androgenic alopecia as a result of estrogen and progesterone declining. It could be stress. So that could be part of it. It could be a nutrient deficiency or it could be something to do with the way that you're styling your hair. Figuring out what the root cause is going to be super helpful. How can I have male pattern being female? Some people do. My hair is thinning and losing edges, the back of the crown where men usually get bald spots. How can this be and what can I do? So if it's falling out in clumps, it generally is related to either an infection or a nutrient deficiency. If it's just women will actually also lose hair in their crown as well. It's just women generally don't have receding hairlines, but some women do. So this is all in general. Generally, women don't, but some women do. And it's likely related to the androgens. That's why men go have that pattern because they have a lot more androgens than we do. Let's see, thank you. Which naturopathic blend do you use instead of spironolactone? Okay, I will put that, I'll type it below that is called saw palmetto. So S-A-W-P-A-L-M-E-T-O, saw palmetto, pygium, which is another herb and nettles. All three of them are together in one blend. And I'll actually put a link below the video on YouTube so that you guys can actually click on that link and use the exact one that I recommend. But any of those three herbs, even if you just use saw palmetto, that can be helpful too. So that is really good. And I'll put a link below the video on YouTube and that would be awesome. And speaking of YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, definitely like, comment, subscribe to my channel because as like a 48 year old mom doctor on YouTube, my videos aren't as exciting as some of the crazy video gamers and stuff. So in order for me to get traction and more women to see this content, it really helps if you like, subscribe and comment. And that is pretty awesome. And in uh, pretty shortly, we're going to be doing a giveaway as well. I think my son might be popping in pretty soon, but I will check on him. Otherwise, we'll do it on the replay. So just put in the comments, hair, love, I love my hair or love your hair. So put that in the comments and we will go ahead and pick one of you for a giveaway for our 21-day metabolic rehab program. It's a $397 program. It's three weeks. It comes with a call with one of my health coaches and you get three weeks of meal plans and health building strategies to help to restore your metabolism and naturally balance your hormones. Okay. Let's see. Is there any known root cause of frontal fibrosing alopecia? Any hope for treatments working to grow hair back? So any of the treatments that we talked about can help. I'm not hundred percent familiar with that form of alopecia, but it might have something to do with the quality of the scalp. I think that definitely minoxidil will probably help you as well reducing stress. I would definitely run a hormone panel, including thyroid to see where your levels are. And if that could be part of the help that, that you possibly need. 
yeah, let's see if I have any of this chat over here. So let me pop. Oh, people are putting in the chat. They love their hair off. Perfect. Let's see. How come my hair? Okay, I answered that. Yeah, let me look at some other questions. So PRP, there are like clinics and aesthetic centers and some plastic surgery centers, med spas that actually do a, it's called platelet rich plasma therapy. So they, they, you, if you've heard of like a vampire facial that was really popular several years ago, where they put it on your face for youthfulness, PRP is basically getting the stem cells out of your own human blood. So they put you, they draw your blood, just like if you're giving blood basically, and they draw your blood and they centrifuge it. So they spin it and they pull out the platelet rich plasma. And that is feeding and nourishing your hair follicles. Or if you do it on your skin, it restores the youthfulness of your skin. So that can be super duper helpful. It's not cheap though. And it's probably not like the first thing I would do but it can be helpful. And then they also do, I showed you my red light, but they actually sell like headbands and helmets that you can buy that you can just plug in and sit there while you watch TV at night. And the red light therapy actually does have a lot of studies on it because the reason why that works is actually because one of the reasons why we lose hair is because of the slowdown of the mitochondria in our hair follicles. So our hair and our hair follicles are one of the most rapidly, um, they have the most rapid turnover of cells. And when the mitochondria, as we age, like our mitochondria starts to get slower and the red light therapy really helps to boost that mitochondria, the number and the strength of your mitochondria. And that can actually really help with hair growth. And that can be helpful for really any of the root causes, but I'm more of a fan of kind of addressing the root cause because in natural medicine, we look at symptoms. But if you think about a tree, you have the root of the tree and then you have the trunk and then you have the branches and the leaves. So the leaves are the symptoms. But if you go all the way down the trunk to the root and you find something wrong, not only is it going to affect the leaf with a symptom, but it's probably going to have other symptoms as well. So that's why I'm always like, if it's a thyroid issue, you definitely want to treat the thyroid, support the thyroid. If it's sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, you want to address those because with hormone replacement therapy, a lot of people are like, we didn't used to need hormone replacement therapy. I should grow up gracefully. Like why now does everybody need hormone replacement therapy? And the reason I'll tell you the reason, because back in 1940, 1940 is like when hormone replacement therapy started. Women didn't really live much past 55, 60. That was like the average lifespan. And now average is 85, 90, older. And so we just can't live half of our lives. The average age of perimenopause is going to be around 40. When you start, your hormones start declining. Menopause is about 50. So if we're living to 85, 90 and beyond, we can't live the rest of half of our lives with no hormones, our bones are going to break, our hair is going to fall out. We're going to, we're going to look horrible. We're going to have, we're going to feel horrible. We're going to be all dried up. We're not going to be able to remember anything. We're going to be horribly mean to our husbands. We just can't do it. So that's why, that's why hormone replacement is necessary now. And maybe wasn't necessary for our great grandmothers because they just didn't live that long. Let's see. I know you're an advocate for bioidentical, but I'm not ready. Are there herbs and alternatives? Yeah. So there are, like I said, there are things you can use like green tea, the ECG, EC, EGCGs in green tea, the powerful antioxidants. And also for that matter, melatonin, there's actually research on both of those that show that those can help with hair growth, but what they're not going to do is give you back estrogen and progesterone. That's why I'm an advocate of bioidentical hormones, but there, it's not right for everybody. What I'm saying is I don't think that everybody has to take hormones, but I think everybody should have the opportunity, but you can definitely do those other things. You can do the minoxidil. You can do the rosemary oil. I'm massaging it into your head. You can take pumpkin seed oil. You can take melatonin. You can do drink green tea. You can do all of those to help with your hair loss. I haven't seen the research on the red raspberry leaf, so I can't really speak to that. I would have to look it up and see if there's any research because some of the things that you read online were only researched in rats and the, like they might've taken like a thousand rats and they did the study and maybe 
out of a thousand rats, two of them had hair growth. So they're like, oh, this plant helps with hair growth, but it wasn't really a good study and it wasn't even on humans. And it also has to be on women. Most of the studies that I reference, if not all of them, have women in the studies because that's a huge disservice to women is when studies are done and the only people in the study are like 22 year old men because that it doesn't apply to us. This is why there's a lot of information online that say that estrogen causes women to be fat. And that's not true. Estrogen doesn't cause us to be fat. Estrogen causes men to be fat and testosterone can cause like belly fat in women. So we really have to look at studies done on women in order to know the validity, but I can't say yes or no on the red raspberry leaf. Let's see, silly question. Does GERD cause issues with hair loss because of protein not getting absorbed? Exactly. You answered your question. So any digestive issue, if you have IBS, if you have GERD, if you have low stomach acid, if you have anorexia or bulimia, anything that's not allowing you to get nutrients into your body, if you're not breaking them down or assimilating them, that can lead to a deficiency. So it can lead to a protein deficiency and also those other nutrients. So with things like zinc and selenium and iodine and boron, you may or may not be able to get the foods that have those food, those nutrients in enough amounts. There's some people who are severely compromised in digestion and they just can't eat a lot of vegetables. So they might not get the boron and they might not get some of those nutrients and the zinc. And you can definitely supplement with either a multi-nutrient and multivitamin, or you can also do like a green string. Come on. Oh, the prize patrol is here. Come on in, Cass. All right. So they, you're going to pick somebody that says they love their hair over here in the chat. Okay. What? We're talking about hair loss. Oh, and you right. have really good hair. I should have actually done my hair today. Yes. Ready. It's sweaty. Yes. Oh, you're playing. All right. So you want to pick someone that wrote, love my hair. Let's see. My, my mouse is not working. There we go. So see all these people. You want to pick somebody? M. Up uh, that one? No, up. M. I choose M. Okay. M. Okay. So I don't know your whole name, but you, your screen name is M. It says, love your hair here. So you message that. 545. So I'm going to, all you have to do, because you have won the 21 day metabolic rehab program and it comes with a consultation with one of my coaches and meal plan and all kinds of really cool techniques. You're going to learn about dry brushing. You're going to learn all kinds of really cool things to do for how to ferment food. So it's really cool. And you've won it. All you need to do is go ahead and email us at support at glownaturalwellness.com. So support at glownaturalwellness.com and send us your address and we'll go ahead and send you your prize. And the program's online, but we'll also send you something in the mail as well. Thank you. Thank you, Paxton. I'm not Paxton. Oh, are you the prize special? And also Snow. Okay. Thank you. And so if you're watching the replay, be sure to comment, love my hair or love your hair in the comments and Paxton will pick another one in the next couple of days. All right. Awesome. The prize patrol is out. A prize patrol out. Thank you, Pax. I'm awesome. Out. Cool. All right. Let me see if there's any other questions that I won't keep you guys. Let's see. What do you think about strength training? Does it raise progesterone to help with androgen issues? So I love strength training. Strength training is awesome. I would say heavy strength training might actually raise testosterone levels, but not, not going to raise or lower your sex binding hormone globulin, sex hormone binding globulin. So I wouldn't shy away from strength training actually is really healthy for your hormones in general. And any type of exercise and circulation is healthy for your hair. Because one of the reasons why you might not be getting proper hair growth could be from lack of circulation. Scalp massages, you have your partners. You do scalp massages, that can be really helpful using that rosemary oil, getting some exercise is going to be healthy all the way around, but also going to stay healthy as well. So I don't think that strength training is going to raise your progesterone, but if you're not yet to like perimenopause, or if you're still cycling and you're not taking hormone replacement therapy, what you can do is you take a supplement called Vitec. It's also known as chaste berry. So it's an herb. 
And that can actually help to balance progesterone levels or optimize the progesterone that you already do have. So that can be helpful. But if you feel that like your androgens might be overwhelming you where not only are you having hair loss, but you might be having some acne, especially around your chin. You might have some greasy skin and you might feel irritable. And you might have those little like, and everyone, everyone has like peach fuzz. So just so you know, everybody has like little peach fuzz skin on their face. That's completely normal. Replaining has become pretty popular among women where they're doing like little shaving their face, so their makeup looks smoother. It's, that's not androgens, but if you get dark hairs, more than one or two, if you're getting a lot of dark hairs, like a mustache or on your chin, that can also be a sign that your androgens are going down that DHT 5A reductase pathway. And so that can actually eventually lead to hair loss. So that's a good sign that you might want to do the saw pygm or salt pimento pygm and nettle supplement, or you might want to consider replacing estrogen and progesterone if you are at that age of perimenopause or menopause, or if you have any other symptoms. Awesome. All right, you guys, thank you so much. I'm going to keep you tonight, but if there's any other questions, go ahead and pop those in the chat. Otherwise, just pop them below in the comments. And I always come back a couple of days later and answer all the questions if I didn't get to them. But I hope this is helpful. Just let me know if this is helpful for you, if this is information maybe you didn't know about, and if you have some things that you can go ahead and do. And I will keep the topics coming. We've got one coming up about strength training. So the person that asked about that, I do have one coming up about designing an exercise program for, for women in perimenopause and menopause, not just for your physical health, but for your mental, emotional, and overall health as well, and your bone health. And we're going to be talking about that soon, but thank you so much. I will talk to you guys soon. Message me on YouTube or anywhere on social and let me know if there's anything I can do to help. All right, you guys take care. Bye-bye.